Ian could remember the time when he first met her. It seemed like she had almost materialized out of the forest. She wore blue jeans and a white t-shirt with a lace pattern around her neck. She was dressed modestly, and she had a kind, gentle smile. Ian thought she had walked out of some summer night's dream. She wore a beautiful golden necklace with a ruby set in the center that hung down to the top of her breast, and she had a polished silver ring on her right hand that was decorated to look like a thorn and briars had wrapped around her finger. Her ring was strange, but by far the oddest part of her outfit was the wreath she wore on her head. It looked like she had cut down green branches and woven them into some sort of sylvan crown. She was beautiful. She had long red hair that was tied in two long braids that hung down to her narrow waist. She was slim, but had a perfect hourglass figure. She had pale white skin, and her features were smooth and flawless with no freckles or blemishes. She had a cute button nose and a perfect smile. When she flashed her perfect white teeth in a smile, Ian felt like his heart would stop. Her laugh was hauntingly beautiful, and she had an almost ethereal voice. As beautiful as she was, it was her eyes that drew her to him. They were deep blue eyes, and he often lost himself looking into them. They seemed to be infinite wells of beauty, like fine sapphires hidden in the depths of the sea. She looked beautiful to him, and he saw her standing on the side of the road. He slowed his truck to a stop and offered her a ride. Ian was a tall, muscular man with wavy auburn hair and sharp aquiline figures. He wore jeans and boots and a plaid shirt with a ball cap. He was handsome, and he seemed to catch her eye in the same way she caught his. He introduced himself and offered her a ride. She gladly accepted and introduced herself as Lilith, and before long, they were talking and laughing like they had known each other their whole lives. Ian lived in a small town called Stonebrook. Most of the people who lived in Stonebrook had lived there for most of their life. Ian had lived in town since he was four, and all of his friends in town went back to his childhood. Lilith was new to town, and was coming to visit her grandmother, who had moved into town in the past few years. Her grandmother was struggling with her health problems, and Lilith was moving in to take care of her. She had gotten lost driving down a country road, and her car had died. She was afraid she would have to walk to town. They would have gone to her grandmother's house, but seeing as she had only just gotten to town and hadn't eaten yet, they decided to go out to eat somewhere. Before long, they were laughing over dinner and sharing stories with each other. Ian couldn't believe how amazing she was, and he was left wondering where she had been all his life. She was mesmerizing, and he was left hanging on her every word as he studied her face, getting lost in every curve and every feature. She found herself looking at him and staring at her own reflection in his deep brown eyes. The two fell deeply in love, and before long they were practically joined at the hip. He visited her often to help her take care of her grandmother, and she joined him on his farm. He visited her often whenever she wasn't taking care of her grandmother, and she joined him on his farm, helping him to tend to horses. They would go for long rides through the forest and leisurely strolls through town. They would dance together in the moonlight and share kisses as they sat beneath the stars. They were the loveliest couple in town, and everyone began to take notice. All of his friends were talking about the strange woman who seemed to come out of nowhere. No one in town minded having a new resident. They all loved Lilith, and she was kind to everyone. But there was something about her that was unsettling to everyone in town. Maybe it was her laugh, or the way she could look into someone's eyes and guess what they were thinking. It might have been the way she smiled, or a certain look in her eye that she would have when she thought no one was looking. Maybe it was just that she was new in town. It seemed like something small, and no one in town could quite put their finger on it. It was like seeing something out of the corner of your eye, and then turning to see there was nothing where it had been. It seemed to them as if the answer would come to them in a dream that would be forgotten as soon as they woke up. No one seemed to be able to place the phenomena, but whatever it was, it was unsettling. It never caused anyone to avoid her. Quite the opposite. It gave her an air of mystery that seemed to draw people to her in even greater numbers. The only one in town who didn't seem to notice anything strange about her was Ian, Maybe whatever seemed strange to the town was normal for Ian. Maybe he knew her well enough to be unfazed by her peculiar nature. Or maybe love had placed blinders on him and kept him from seeing her more mysterious side. It certainly wouldn't have been impossible. As far as anyone in town could tell, Ian was completely under her spell, and to him she was perfect. If he saw any blemish or imperfection in her, he had the whole town fooled. Oftentimes when Ian was with his friends, they would try to explain to him how peculiar she seemed. But whenever they tried to describe how she seemed to them, they seemed to lose the words. The same fog came over them that kept them from noticing what was so unusual about her. He would see their feeble attempts of an explanation and laugh at them and tell them that they were jealous. Most people in town would shake their heads and sigh after an attempt to explain to Ian Lilith's strange nature. But one man in town seemed to be almost fixated on the point. Simon, Ian's best friend, had thought that she was suspicious from the moment she got in town. Simon never liked new people in town, but she seemed abnormal even for strangers in town. 
He felt like he was closer than anyone to trying to put his finger on what was so strange about her. But no matter how hard he tried, he still couldn't explain why Lilith was so peculiar. It was beyond frustrating for him, and he would often rant to anyone who would listen that Lilith wasn't to be trusted. Every time he went on one of his rants, though, someone would press Simon for specifics. Without fail, Simon would narrow his eyes and stare off into space before having to admit he didn't have any reason for being suspicious of her. This left him even more annoyed, and he would often wave them away and insist that she was just strange. As crazy as he seemed whenever he began to talk about Lilith, most people in town had to admit that there was something strange about her, even if no one knew what it was. Simon's opinions about Lilith became a point of contention, and Ian and Simon almost had a falling out over it. The closer that Ian and Lilith grew, the more strained the two friends became, to the point that where Ian almost kicked Simon out of his house one evening. Ian felt like Lilith was an angel that had come down from heaven, just for him, and the idea that she might be anything else was offensive to him. Ian and Lilith continued to grow closer, and when Ian asked Lilith to marry him, Simon had almost had a heart attack. Ian couldn't have cared less. He and Lilith were the picture of happiness, and they began making wedding preparations. They opted to have an outdoor wedding in September, in one of the prettiest parks in town, and before long they had planned out the perfect wedding. The only issue where the two of them ran into any troubles was deciding who would perform the wedding. Ian had suggested several pastors, but Lilith had insisted on the county judge. Ian didn't understand why the matter was so important to her, but it didn't matter too much to him, and he relented to her demands. Finally, the day arrived. Practically the whole town attended to the wedding, and half of the park was taken up for the reception. Ian and Simon were still on rough terms because of their disagreement about Lilith, and Ian had almost avoided inviting him to the wedding. But after one of their worst fights, the two made up, and Ian made Simon his best man. Simon, of course, was still very uncomfortable about the situation, and still thought Lilith was strange, and didn't trust her. But when the day of the wedding came, he was the first one there, and he gave a speech at the reception that brought the whole crowd to tears. Everyone had a wonderful time at the reception. Ian and Lilith weren't the best dancers at their own wedding, but they knew how to square dance well enough, and they were too focused on each other to notice any of the other couples dancing at the reception. Finally, it came time for the slow dance, and the two looked so beautiful and happy together that a rock could have cried tears of joy. When the reception was over, they rushed away from the crowd towards their limo to catch a flight to the airport. Most people in town had grown so accustomed to the two lovers that when they left for their honeymoon, many of the town's residents didn't know what to do. It was like a part of the town had gone missing when they left. Meanwhile, Ian and Lilith enjoyed their honeymoon in Florida. They would spend the whole day together laughing and talking, and end each day with a long kiss under the moonlight. It was as if they were in a dream or a fairy tale, and each moment they spent together was magical. It was a bit of an adjustment when the two came back. Normal life wasn't quite as interesting as the honeymoon in Florida, but even quiet life in Ian's farmhouse was enough to enchant the two young lovers. Ian helped to move Lilith into the farmhouse, and was surprised by how much stuff she had despite not having brought very much with her when she had moved to town. Before long, Lilith had decorated their home, and helped to bring life to the drab walls. By that point, it was mid-October, and so Lilith had brought forth a litany of fall decorations. She put up pumpkins and other gourds, leaves, fall wreaths, signs with cliché sayings about autumn, and pumpkin-scented candles. She had stocked the house with fall drinks like pumpkin spice coffee and apple cider, and before long the house looked like an advertisement for autumn. Ian wasn't the biggest fan of all the new clutter, but he didn't mind too much, and having Lilith with him was worth the overdone decorations. He even helped her at one point by setting up scarecrows with jack-o'-lantern heads around the property. Before long, things began to settle into a normal routine. Ian spent much of his time tending the farm and the animals, and Lilith would tend to her grandmother. She spent most of the day with her grandma, and after visiting once, he could understand why she spent as much time as she did. The woman looked ancient and decrepit. It looked like if the wind picked up that she would crumble into dust and be blown away. The house where she lived was way too big for her, and Ian was surprised she could do anything other than lay in bed and wait for death. Ian figured that whatever time Lilith had left with the woman was precious, and never protested the time that his wife spent with the woman. Far from it, he offered to help tend to her grandmother, but Lilith insisted that he let her alone with the woman. The way Lilith insisted that she be left alone with her grandmother seemed strange to Ian. He had assumed she would welcome help, and instead she seemed almost angry at the thought that he would visit. When he had gone to visit, it had been for a very short time before he was sent away. Lilith would always say that she had a delicate constitution, and that any visitor might excite her too much. It made sense that any stress could be fatal to the old woman, but when Ian met her, she seemed to be held together out of spite. He doubted that being excited would do much for the woman's health. Still, he let the matter drop, and went to work or tended the farm, and Lilith would always come back in the evenings, and the two would enjoy their time together in each other's company. Two weeks passed that way, and for two weeks, Ian was happier than he had ever been. Things seemed to be going well for him, too. He had gotten a raise at his job, one of his horses gave birth to a colt, and even things between him and Simon began to get better.
Simon was still suspicious, but voiced his opinions less around Ian, and the two were able to go back to some semblance of normal. Things might have gone on that way, too. But one night, Lilith didn't come home. She had sent him a text to let him know that she would be at her grandmother's house. He had been disappointed, but went on with his evening without her. He didn't expect to see her until morning, or even until the next night. But around four o'clock in the morning, Lilith came home. She was quiet, and seemed to be trying not to wake him. But his eyes fluttered open drowsily. It was hard to make out anything in the dark, but he could make out her shape in the moonlight. She dressed much the same, but something looked off about her. She looked much older, and she had worn, shriveled features. Her nails were long and sharp, and her hair looked white in the moonlight. Ian couldn't believe his own eyes and tried to get up and get a closer look at his wife, but when he tried, he found himself paralyzed and stuck to the bed. He was about to panic, but before he could, he passed out. When he woke up in the morning, he rolled over and looked at Lilith. She was her normal self, and she looked to be smiling peacefully in her sleep. She looked like she had when she had left for her grandmother's the previous morning, but with one major difference. Blood had been smeared across her forehead in a long, thick line. Ian was startled, and got up quickly. He stumbled towards the bathroom and splashed water on his face. Had the night before been real? It couldn't have been real. Lilith looked normal. Better than normal, even. If anything, she looked even more beautiful and youthful than she had the day before. There was no way she could have been that shriveled hag he had seen in the dark. Ian knew that it had to be his mind playing tricks on him. He had simply heard her come into the room while he slept, and his subconscious had cooked up a nightmare because of it. He had just been worried for her, and what he had seen had just been a dream. It had to be nothing more than an overactive imagination. But still, there was the blood smeared across her forehead. Ian stepped back out and looked at Lilith. She looked like a sleeping angel, and he couldn't help but notice how beautiful she was. He wanted to believe that he had just been dreaming, but the bloody mark on her face was still there. He shook his head and went outside to take care of the horses. He just needed to take them for a ride and clear his head. The horses greeted him excitedly and he knew he had overslept. As he fed them, cleaned them, and saddled them, he couldn't help but think about the strange events of the previous night. He hated to even think about it, but he thought back to all the warnings that Simon had given him. Could he trust her? Wasn't she hiding something about her grandmother? As he took his horses for a ride, he did his best to dismiss any misgivings. He would just talk to her about it. Whatever it was, it probably had a reasonable explanation, and he knew that she would be able to explain everything to him. He was just being paranoid, and he needed to trust her. That was the answer to his problems. He took the horses back and put them out to pasture before heading inside the house for a shower. When he got inside the house, he realized that Lilith was gone. She had left him a note explaining that she was going back to her grandmother's house. Ian got an unsettled feeling in his gut. He felt like there was something strange happening, but he couldn't explain it. Still, there was nothing he could do, so he got his shower and went about with his day. After he got out of the shower, his day got progressively weirder. As Ian walked by a shelf with a flower pot on it, the flower pot fell off the shelf without warning. He knew he hadn't touched it, and there was no reason it should have fallen over, but somehow it had. He had left to get a broom to clean up the mess, and when he came back, the dirt pot was crawling with maggots. As soon as he was done cleaning up the mess, he put in a call for the exterminator. Later on in the day, he heard a loud scratching sound from underneath the house. He kept looking around to find the sound, but no matter where he went to look, he couldn't find it. He looked in the pantry and in the vents and under the cabinets, but there was nothing. Finally, he got a flashlight and he crawled under the crawl space of the house, looking for the source of the sound. As he crawled under the house, the sound got progressively louder until all of a sudden a black mass jumped out at him. He screamed to cover his face, but whatever it was ran right past him out into the open air. When he got out of the crawl space, he stood up and saw a pure black cat sitting on a fence post. Ian had never seen the cat before, and he knew there was no way it should have been able to get on top of the fence. He shuddered as he looked at the cat, but it just ignored him and proceeded to give itself a bath. Later in the evening, he heard a rapping noise at the door. He got up to check it, but there was no one there. He sighed and went back to cooking his dinner. It was late enough that he was starting to wonder where Lilith was and when she would be back. He had just sat down to eat when he heard a second knock. He got up, slightly annoyed at the interruption, but when he opened the door, there was no one there. The only thing he saw was a crow sitting on the porch railing. He eyed the crow suspiciously before closing the door. He was halfway through his meal when he heard a third knock. He tried ignoring it, but it kept knocking on the door and the knocking got louder until he got up and flung the door open angrily. He expected to see no one there on the other side of the door, but instead he was greeted by one of his scarecrows. He jumped back, startled by the scarecrow. His heart was racing and he let out a startled cry. The scarecrow fell inward and loomed over him like a menacing specter. When he recovered from the initial scare, he began to investigate. He knew someone had placed the scarecrow on the front porch, but when he looked around, he couldn't find anyone. He called out to the potential pranksters, but there was no one nearby. There was no sign of a person having moved the scarecrow except for a long line in the dirt where the scarecrow had been dragged up to the house. He felt a chill run down his spine. 
and as he turned back to look at the scarecrow, it swung around as if to stare at him. He threw the scarecrow on the ground next to the porch and went inside. He locked the door behind him and sat in the living room watching the window. He wasn't hungry anymore, and he didn't bother finishing his meal. Instead, he sat in the corner in a rocking chair and rocked back and forth nervously. He felt like he was the butt of some practical joke, and he didn't like it. His mind drifted back to his dream from the night before, and the blood smeared on Lilith's forehead. The more he thought about it and the weird things that had happened to him throughout the day, the more unsettled he became. He wanted to just say that he was being paranoid, but something genuinely strange was happening. Finally, after thinking about it for several hours, he gave Simon a call. He and Simon met up at dinner the next day and sat down to talk about it. I think I might owe you an apology, Ian said. Things have gotten really strange since Lilith and I got back. I told you something was off about her, Simon said with a vindicated look. Seeing the look on Ian's face, he had, Sorry, Ian. Ian shrugged. You're right. I should have listened to you. A lot of weird things have been happening lately, and I don't know what to do about it. Simon raised an eyebrow. Well, I know she was odd, but what do you mean weird? Ian shrugged. It's hard to explain it. She's been acting differently lately, and it's been making me uncomfortable. You tried talking to her about it? Simon asked half-heartedly. She's been gone at her grandmother's house the last couple of days. You can always go over and talk to her at her grandmother's house, Simon pointed out. Ian shook his head. She doesn't like me going over there. I think she's hiding something. Simon sat back with a sigh. Well, you could always follow her over there and see what she's hiding. Ian scoffed. I can't spy on my wife. Simon shrugged. Suit yourself. But if you want to find out what she's up to, you need to follow her. Ian told Simon he wouldn't spy on his wife, and Simon let the issue slide. They talked for a couple of hours before Ian went home. His wife was still gone, so he decided to turn in early. He couldn't get Simon's advice out of his head, though. He was up for hours thinking about it before he finally decided to follow Lilith. Something still felt wrong about it, but as soon as he decided to follow her, he felt more relaxed. The next day he got up and saw Lilith was gone again. He read her note and knew that he would be on his own again that day. He took care of a few chores and ran some errands before heading over to Lilith's grandmother's house. By the time he got there, it was already getting dark. He parked a fair way away and walked the rest of the way to the house. When he got there, he felt somewhat sheepish about what he was about to do. But just when he thought about turning around, he heard Lilith step out of the front door. He ducked behind a nearby tree and waited for her to head to her car. Instead of heading to her car, though, she headed for the woods. She looked like she was being cautious, and she looked over her shoulder to see if anyone was behind her. Fortunately for Ian, she didn't seem to notice him. She walked into the woods, and Ian followed her. It grew steadily darker as the sun set. The woods took on an eerie feel, and that, combined with the fact that he was spying on Lilith, made him feel nervous. He had to fight not to jump at shadows. She walked deep into the woods with surprising speed, and it was hard for Ian to follow her without making noise. He followed her for a couple of miles before she stopped. The woods had become dense and thick, and Ian had gotten more than a couple of scrapes from branches and briars. Lilith had stopped in a clearing, though, and Ian could see what she was doing. To his surprise, Lilith was greeted by her grandmother. The two women stood next to a campfire with a big cooking pot over the coals. Lilith pulled out some items from her jacket and started adding them into the cooking pot. Ian watched with a sort of fascinated horror as the women worked on their concoction. As they added more ingredients, it began to boil vigorously, and the pot began to shake violently. Ian's eyes got big as he watched them. Lilith began to chant, and her grandmother pulled out a classic water bottle. The bottle was red and dark, and while she was chanting, Lilith stripped off her outer layer of clothing, and her grandmother started smearing her with the liquid. As Ian watched, he realized why Lilith had been gone so late into the night, and he knew why Lilith had blood smeared across her face. He watched on with growing horror as Lilith's grandmother started chanting, and both women began to change before his very eyes. Lilith's grandmother changed very little. She grew long, sharp claws, and her eyes became black, but aside from that, she looked unchanged. Lilith began to change very rapidly, though, seeming to age several years in a matter of seconds. Ian cried out in horror as his once beautiful wife became a shriveled, hag-like monster. As soon as he cried out, the two women turned and looked at him furiously. He ran as fast as he could, but in a moment she was on top of him. He screamed and cried out for help, but it was no use. She looked at him with her terrible, wrinkled face and gave him a wicked grin. She was stronger than she had any right to be, and he tried to wiggle out of her grip, but she held him in place. She leaned in close to him, and he started to panic as she kissed him on the lips. He screamed as she drew back from the kiss, and he saw her raise her hand. She brought it down on him and cut short one last blood-curdling cry.